Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I think you, most of you know who I am. I'm Ann Doyle, the archivist for the Quantum Talk Historical Society. Um, I especially uh, want to welcome Steve and Marlene, um, Steve's wife, uh, here tonight. And uh, uh, they are here in Quantum for their annual October visit from California. And we are so fortunate that we can spend a little time with them. We also want to welcome Steve Finnegan. Steve is right there. Um, this other Steve is the curator for the Submarine uh, Museum in Rotten, Connecticut. And our Steve will be giving the same presentation as he is tonight to, at the museum this coming Saturday. Um, every year when Steve and Marlene come to Kwani, Steve always makes a visit to see what's going on at, at the Kwanakantog Historical Society. And this year, Steve is <coughs> part of what's going on. <laughs> he is obviously very connected to Kwani and our history. About four years ago, Steve invited Tom and I to his home so that he could share his recent PowerPoint presentation he had created about his grandfather, Mr. Moran, and Mr. Moran's experience as a World War I submariner, right? Submariner. Did I say that right? Okay. I keep wanting to say submariner. Submariner, and that's not right. Um, Many of you remember Mr. Moran as a longtime Quanty resident coming here all the way from Norwich, Connecticut. I always knew him by sight, but not in any other way. I re remember him as being older and walking with a cane. I had heard of him being a part of the Runny Nose Club with six other men and friends, but had no idea what that was all about. I never, I never did find out about them, but I hear that they had very serious discussions. And then they took walks. That's all I know now. I knew where he lived on Surfside Avenue. At this time, I had no idea of who this Steve was. The photos on the display table show a part of Mr. Moran's life in Kwani, and it does not touch on his World War I experience. I thought it was important for you to have some view of his life here as well as what you will be learning tonight. Now for a brief overview, Steve's grandparents were Dick and Helen Moran. They bought their 20 lot in 1948 and completed building their home in 1950 at 150 Surfside Avenue. Steve and his family have been coming to Quine for 70 years. And finally, Steve is here this evening to share with us his revised PowerPoint presentation about his grandfather. He is here to honor his grandfather who served as a submariner in World War I. Mr. Moran died in 1977 at the age of 77, is that correct? 79. Nine, 79, okay, I missed that. So if you would please welcome Steve Young. So thankful for Anne for all she's done, and I know there's a whole group of people that have worked very hard to make the Kwani Kwani Kentog Historical Society a success. Uh, I think it's so valuable and so important, and I'm glad that I can play a small role tonight in uh, honoring my grandfather, uh, Dick Moran. A wise man told me one time that uh, we all die twice. You die once when your heart stops, and you die a second time when people stop remembering you. And one of my goals is to keep the memory of my grandfather alive, and thank you for coming tonight and helping me do that. I'm very focused on just two years of his life, 1917 to 1919, 
I hope you're interested in World War I because uh, this is largely about uh, World War I, but I do try to connect it to uh, Kwani at the end. So my grandfather, uh, Dick Moran, his formal name was Richard Carroll Moran. He was born in Norwich, Connecticut in 1898, and his parents were John and Mary Moran, who had immigrated to the United States from Ireland uh, years before. Dick was one of seven uh, Moran boys, uh, a family of all uh, boys, and he completed the eighth grade and then he went to work, which I think was relatively common uh, for people uh, in his generation. So, the United States did not enter World War I until 1917, but World War I started in 1914 and was a massive war in, in Europe. Uh, and it was really a difficult uh, war. Um, this is, you know, it was largely trench warfare. Um, it was very, very brutal. Uh, the food was terrible, the medicine was terrible, the logistics were terrible. Uh, these men really, really, really uh, suffered. And you all have a great opportunity tonight, uh, if you know how to run your DVRs. Uh, there is a great movie producer by the name of Peter Jackson, uh, who produced The Hobbit and produced Lord of the Rings. He's a New Zealand filmmaker, very successful, became a zillionaire with those big successes. And he has a big film studio in New Zealand. And he got the idea to visit the Imperial British War Museum in London. And they had 200 hours of World War I footage um, from... Uh, of British soldiers before we actually entered the war. And he took those 200 hours back to his film laboratory in New Zealand, and he made a two-hour film. Maybe it's a little shorter than two hours. And he basically wanted to tell the story of the soldiers of World War I. And he was able to colorize the footage that he selected. Uh, because the cameras were hand cranked in those days, everybody cranked at a different rate. So you see a lot of soldiers, you know, moving very fast and you see some soldiers moving very slowly. So he was able in his film laboratory to sync everything. He also wanted the soldiers to tell their own story. So he uh, hired uh, lip readers, because this is all silent footage, and he had lip readers read the lips of the soldiers in the film, and he hired actors then to say their lines. So the reason I mention that is if you're interested in World War I, tonight at 11 o'clock on HBO, they're playing his film, it's called Thou Shall Not Grow Old, and it's so impactful. And it's such a good portrayal of the really, really, really difficult circumstances of World War I uh, of the ground soldiers. My grandfather had the presence of mind to join the Navy rather than the Army. And World War I broke out in 1914. In 1915, the Lusitania was sunk by... German U-boats, and there was a big push to have the United States enter World War I. There was also a big push not to enter World War I. That was a European problem, and we wanted to be isolationists and stay out of the European uh, war because it was a meat grinder. M millions of, of uh, soldiers were dying. 
but the Lusitania was uh, a canard ship. It had some very wealthy New Yorkers on it. It had uh, the Vanderbilts on it. And 1,260 people went down in the Lusitania in 1915. Um, and it was torpedoed by, by German U-boats. Nevertheless, we did not enter the war, but uh, Dick Moran was 18 years old, and the war was ablaze, and he signed up for the Connecticut military census, I guess, to get a draft card. I'm not sure that that's what they called it then, but he did that in 1917. He listed himself on the document as an 18-year-old electrician living at Boswell Avenue in Norwich, Connecticut. Uh, he was 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighed 130 pounds and was 18 years old at the time. On April 6, 1917, uh, four years after the war started, the U.S. entered World War I and um, Three days later, my grandfather, Dick Moran, signed the paperwork to jo jo excuse me, join the U.S. Uh, Navy. Uh, he did it in Newport, Rhode Island. And the next two weeks, he went to some type of very, very basic training. Uh, the training in World War I was grossly inadequate. I mean, when you see Peter Jackson's <coughs> movie, they will show you that the training was taking people off of the farms, giving them a rifle with a bayonet and some stuffed straw dummies, and you would practice stabbing your rifle and bayonet in the, uh, into the dummies, and within a week they had you in a uniform and out the door, and you were a, a soldier in the trenches. Um, so, did I skip one? So this is a picture of him doing some basic training, I believe, in that first couple of week period, learning flags. And then on April 19, 1917, he formally enlisted in the U.S. Navy, and he left Norwich, Connecticut for the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and he went to the Pratt Institute to learn to become a Navy electrician and all this was reported in the local Norwich newspaper. <coughs> I'm so pleased that my grandmother um, kept a scrapbook of pictures, and I have a son who's a professional photographer, and this is literally a one inch by two inch picture that was in a scrapbook, and my son photographed it with a special lens and did some editing to restore it. Oh. And this is my grandfather as a plebe. I'm not sure that's the right terminology, but at the Brooklyn Naval Yard getting training as, elect an, as an electrician. And you can see the title is called Wash Day where apparently they're all out washing their clothes. Uh, uh, and you'll enjoy, I think, this next photo. Being a typical 18-year-older horsing around, this is him on the right, and you can see one of his colleagues has a plank over his shoulder and one guy hops on one end of the plank, and my grandfather hops on the other end of the plank for entertainment during wash day, you know, in Brooklyn, and they're balancing, you know, on his shoulder. And again, this was a one inch by one and a half inch uh, picture that my son was able to uh, bring back and restore. So it surprises me what uh, the Norwich bulletin thinks is news because he came home for two days of leave, May 22nd, according to the local newspaper, 
And you wouldn't think that would be news, but it was news in 2017, and this is him on his porch with his dog uh, being reunited for a couple of days while in training. Oh, what did I say? 1917? Oh, it says 2017? Nope, sorry about that. So I don't really understand uh, the housing situation that he was in, but I think he was in a boarding room, and you will see several pictures, and, you know, he's got his American flag, he's got his rosary beads, he's got a picture of my grandmother, uh, who was, he was engaged to, and he's in a room with five beds or so, and this is his bed. And there's a picture of him with, I think, his fellow boarders in Brooklyn. Uh, and he's in his Navy uniform, but they appear to be businessmen or salesmen, or I don't know who, uh, what their professions were, but I think he's playing cribbage, which my, my grandfather had a love of and taught his children and taught us his grandchildren, uh, to like uh, cribbage. And you can see it's the same room with the same thermometer and the same uh, rosary beads on the wall. So I love this picture. This is his graduation from the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. And it's about a six-month course, and he graduated. And being a knucklehead 18-year-older, he did us the favor of circling his head. And you will see in several of the pictures that he sent to my grandmother, who kept the scrapbook, uh, where he circled his head whenever he's in a group picture, which I don't think we would be able to pick him out but for his uh, circling his head. I presume these are his professors who taught him you know, the art of uh, being an electrician in the Navy. And you will see he also, well, I'll get to that in a moment, but um, after he completed that course, he got sent to one of the big East Coast naval bases uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, for additional training. And he seems to have spent months uh, both in Norfolk this is him in that picture. And again, these were really low quality, tiny uh, pictures taken 100 years ago that we've been able to restore. But he also uh, took training in New London, which of course was the submarine uh, base. This is a picture where he's written, I believe it's him, of, he's written Norfolk, Virginia on the back of it. Um, and after completing his training in Brooklyn at the Pratt Institute in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, oops, did I go the wrong way? Sorry. So, I found this chart interesting, and Steve Finnegan is here from the Submarine Museum, and I think Steve turned me on to this, but when the Lusitania was sunk by German U-boats, and the Germans were having such great success with their U-boats, I think it dawned on the United States that these are really machines that we need and we don't have. And we had a very small submarine fleet. The British fleet was bigger than ours. The German fleet was way bigger than ours. So we did a huge building boom and we built submarines in this 1915 to 1919 period. We built about 106 uh, submarines, and most of them were built in East Coast uh, 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 shipyards, but 34 of them were built on the West Coast. And actually, before we entered the war, we needed to stay neutral, so we were building submarines in Vancouver to have the facade of being neutral, even though we were building uh, submarines. But submarines have different classes. And, you know, there are H-class submarines, there are L-class submarines, 
So in this period, they're doing R-class submarines. And he was on the R-18, which is this submarine. And it was built at the Union Iron Works in San Francisco. And the hull was laid down in May of 1917. It was launched in December of 1917. It was commissioned in August of 1918. And... Oops. Sorry. Let's see. There we go. And it was commissioned in September of uh, 1918. And I'll get into its history, but you can see Four River... Uh, shipbuilding, I believe, is in Massachusetts, and in a real short period of time, in 1917 and 1918, they turned out uh, 13 or so, 14 uh, submarines, and then the Union Iron Works in San Francisco turned out five R-class submarines, two, four, six uh, R-class submarines, and the Lake Tor torpedo boat company, which I think is Bridgeport, Connecticut, turned out uh, some more uh, submarines, the uh, R-21 to R-25, I think, the line is cut off. Uh, but these submarines uh, were built for World War I. They were the state of the art. Everybody wanted to be on them. They're frontline Fight, fighting ready uh, machines with the latest uh, technology. And my grandfather was lucky enough to be assigned to the R-18. Um, and they went on after the war ended. They were mothballed for uh, uh, a few decades and then they were uh, recommissioned for World War II and they were used in World War II for training purposes and uh, other purposes. The unfortunate part of this is you can't see a R-class submarine anymore. They're all gone. They were all scrapped in 1946, 1948. Um, none of them exist. The ones that were built uh, in Bridgeport were scrapped in 1930 and weren't uh, weren't more mothballed. But I'd love to go on one and I'd love to see what they're like because I think they were very, very small and very cramped. Bad air, bad food, bad sanitation. Uh, it was a rough life. So I think these are pictures that Steve was uh, able to give me from the Submarine Museum. But uh, this is the R-18 being built in San Francisco, and the R-19 to its right, and the R-20 uh, to its left, and you can get some idea of the size and the shape of the hull. This is the stern view of uh, them in the shipyard being built. I like this picture because you can see, you know, the men sometimes are wearing vests and sometimes wearing top hats. And these are pretty rough, tough steel workers, uh, you know, turning these submarines out as fast as uh, uh, they could turn them out. This is now December. I think the earlier pictures were uh, months before, but they're starting to ship, take shape. And rather than calling them the R18, R19, R20, they started giving them SS numbers. So this is SS95 was the R18, <coughs> number six was the R20, or, 19 and uh, 97 was the R20. So, Steve, I need your, I mean, uh, Tom, I need your expertise here for a minute. That came up. Yeah, perfect. 
So the R-18 was launched uh, on January 8, 1918. And I guess Marion Russell was a famous lady in that period of time, and she took the bottle of champagne and she cracked it over the ship and it went down the, the launch uh, pad into uh, San Francisco Bay. So the R-18 was 186 feet long, had only an 18 foot beam, so if you think how small six yards is, that was the beam uh, of these submarines. Uh, it only had a 14 and a half foot draft. Uh, it could go 12 and a half knots on the surface and 10 and a half knots submerged. I don't think they spent a lot of time submerged. Uh, and it housed 29 men in very, very cramped quarters. And I learned a new terminology. I don't know if you've ever heard of hot bedding. But hot bedding is when you are on shifts. And when a shift changes, you hop out of your bunk and somebody hops into your bunk. And then you sleep for four hours. And then somebody else is going into your uh, bunk. So these were crowded uh, spaces. Um, the R-18 had four 21-inch in diameter, I believe, uh, torpedo tubes, and it had a 50 caliber uh, deck gun that fired three inch uh, rounds, and it was capable of diving to 200 feet. So submarine technology was very, so I pressed the wrong button again and that came up again. So when I put my hand there, it goes off. So what are you doing to take it off again? Oh, okay, just, click. just clicking. Okay, sorry. I'll be more careful. So according to the Norwich uh, newspaper, uh, Dick Moran, after being trained as a chief gyro compass man, left, submarine, left the submarine base in New London, Connecticut, bound for San Francisco, California. So... I believe before magnetic compasses, they used gyro compasses. And gyro compasses were part of the navigation system of the submarine and were also part of the navigation system of the torpedoes. So you needed a gyro man uh, on board, and my grandfather apparently was the gyro uh, compass man on the R-18. When you think of uh, 18-year-old with a eighth grade education, probably had never been very far from Norwich before, and now all of a sudden he's gone to Brooklyn, he's gone to Norfolk, and he's being put on a train uh, in New London and trained uh, to San Francisco. And his assignment is an exciting assignment, I would think, for an 18-year-old, where you are going to be on a uh, battle-ready uh, submarine right out of the uh, shipyard, and you're going to be on the maiden crew of, you know, a premier state-of-the-art fighting machine. And to get there, of course, never having been out of Norwich, Connecticut before, you're going to cross... 20 some states, or I don't know how many states you cross to get to San Francisco, but what an adventure and how exciting it must have been uh, to be in his uh, shoes in 1918 with this assignment and uh, uh, training across the United States. So this is a picture where he hasn't circled his head, but it's in San Francisco, a cable car, and this is the uh, Navy men at attention. And when a ship comes out of the shipyard, you need to train the crew, you need to make sure it works right, you need to make sure the torpedoes fire right. Uh, so there's all kinds of testing 
and training and sea trials and shakedown cruises and before the ship is commissioned. And the R-18 was commissioned on September 9th, 1918. My grandfather was deployed from New London to San Francisco in the spring. So I believe he <coughs> participated uh, in the R-18's um, sea trials and shakedown cruises. And when the ship was ready, and when the crew was ready, the, its first assignment was to go to the new uh, U.S. submarine base in San Pedro, California, which is the port of Los Angeles, 400 miles south of San Francisco. So that was the first cruise of any length that the R-18 took coming out of the shipyard. And one, th well, I'll cover that in another slide. So they did submergence tests where they're at a dock, but they sink, you know, the ship to a certain level to test it. Um, these are pictures, again, that I got from the submarine museum of an R-class submarine, maybe not the R-18 specifically, but these are the four torpedo tubes, and I believe these uh, ships carry eight torpedoes. So this is a picture I want you to remember. This is now a year before. This is April of 1917 when uh, the U.S. Pacific Submarine Fleet was created in San Pedro, California. And it was the operational base for 18 submarines. These are some H-class submarines lashed together. But this dock and this space you're going to see is important uh, later on in my presentation. So remember this slide. <coughs> So they established a submarine training school in San Pedro, and they tested torpedoes, and they trained the men and the recruits uh, to be deployed uh, in World War I. So every submarine fleet has a ship tender, and in San Pedro, the ship tender was called the Beaver, and here you see it with men on board these pretty small submarines um, and the tenders, I think, supplied the food, supplied more torpedoes, uh, uh, basically were the home base uh, uh, for each submarine. And this is a picture I think Steve got me of, here's the R-18 right here lashed together with nine other R-class submarines to the ship tender uh, uh, at some point in time. <coughs> so this is a portion of the first crew of the R-18, and my grandfather is not in this picture. Um, but that brings up another subject. So not only was my grandmother's scrapbook a source of great pictures, Steve and his colleagues at the Submarine Museum were a great source of pictures, but I have a third source of pictures, um, and this came from that third source, which I will tell you more about, and he's in this picture, and that's part of the crew. So when the sh ship left San Francisco uh, and came to San Pedro, my grandfather took uh, a weekend shore leave, and he chose to go from San Pedro, which is the port of Los Angeles, to Pasadena, which is just north of uh, uh, Los Angeles. And they had something called the Costin Ostrich Farm, and here's an 18-year-old kid, you know, having fun uh, in a Surrey being pulled by an ostrich. 
I have another picture that I brought with me where he's, uh, there's this huge alligator and he's got his knee on the back of the alligator <laughs> getting his picture taken. And I don't know what insurance company insured that uh, uh, company, but it seems like a relatively dangerous thing to do. None. <laughs> um, you know, being a fellow from Norwich, uh, he had no idea what cactus was, so he had his picture taken in front of cactus in uh, Pasadena and thought that was pretty cool to send to his fiance uh, back in Norwich. So, this is a really neat picture. It kind of gives you the idea of how narrow these submarines were. They're sitting on the gangplank, and this is my grandfather. And this picture is interesting to me for a couple of reasons. One is you'll see the next slide, but the R-18 or the R-class submarines, and Steve knows more about this than I, had what they called disappearing guns. The 50 caliber deck gun was put on, taken off, put on, taken off. <laughs> and could disappear, and I believe this was the stanchion for the 50 caliber deck gun. So this is a picture from the scrapbook, and it says on the back of the photo uh, that shipmate Bullock was washed overboard from that location. So it's the same location with the same gangplank that they were sitting on, the same stanchion uh, for the deck gun, and uh, apparently Seaman Bullock, I don't know whether he was saved or not saved, but he was washed overboard uh, from the location that they had just been sitting at. This is another <coughs> picture from the submarine museum, uh, but you can see the deck gun you can see where they store the torpedoes. Um, they apparently use cork to give the submarine some flotation. Uh, so it was lined with cork, and, and I suppose that was for insulation also. So, you know, I talk about the disappearing deck guns. Here they all have their deck guns out and ready. So, after being in San Pedro for several months, uh, the R-18 was given a mission. And the mission that they were given was to guard the Atlantic Gate of the Panama Canal. And if you know your geography, it's at least over a thousand <coughs> miles from San Pedro uh, to Panama. And to get to the Atlantic Gate, you've got to go through the Panama Canal. So this is a picture of submarines, you know, lashed together. And they're so narrow that, you know, four of them can pass through the gate at the same time. You could probably get more through the gate at the same time. But I love that historical picture. Uh, the Panama Canal had only opened in 1914, and this is 1918, uh, with the four submarines that you see crossing. So to get to the Atlantic gate of the Panama Canal, uh, Coco Solo was their assignment, but to get there you had to go through the Gatun Lakes, or Gatun Locks, you had to go through Gatun Lake, uh, and you had to enter uh, the Pacific gate of the Panama Canal at Balboa or, uh, at, yeah, at Balboa. So again, for an 18-year-old kid from Norwich, this must have been a thrill to go south over a thousand miles on a submarine and then cross Panama and to get what would be a relatively important assignment, I would think, to protect the Panama Canal uh, in World War uh, one from uh, the Germans. So my other source of pictures, uh, 
gave me this picture, and this is the R-18, and it's crossing Gatun Lake in Panama on its way to Coco Solo. <coughs> this is from his scrapbook. It's another example of a one inch by two inch uh, picture that we were able to blow up, but this is my grandfather in his overalls, and he labels it outside the mansion at Coco Solo. <laughs> So these were pretty rough characters that were manning these submarines. And again, my grandfather was nice enough to circle himself in the group photo. But this is in the fall of 1918 uh, in Panama. And this is part of uh, the crew. And as I say, they're a rough, tough bunch. So. Yeah, on November 11th, 1918, uh, the war ended, and an armistice was signed, and here my grandfather's only recently gotten to his assignment at Coco Solo with the R-18, and I'm sure they're ready for a fight, but there's nobody to fight because the war ends, um, and uh, the armistice is signed. And here's a picture of cleanup day on the R-18 in Coco Solo in December of 1918. And they apparently have been recalled uh, back to San Pedro. We don't need you in Coco Solo anymore. Again, he's kind enough to circle his head in the group shot. These were diesel engine submarines, and they always joke that you can smell a submariner because their skin is so infused with the smell of diesel uh, being in this tight quarters all these uh, months. So the ship made its way back to San Pedro outside of Los Angeles, to the port of Los Angeles. It was back in January of 1919. And there's a picture of the R-18. And the submarine was overhauled and sent back to Mare Island, where it was basically built in San Francisco, uh, to be refurbished sometime in March of 1919. So this is a picture in the spring of 1919, uh, where many of the R-class submarines were uh, sent to Honolulu. And San Pedro was no longer the U.S. West Coast submarine base. They moved it to Honolulu. And uh, my grandfather didn't get to make that trip. Uh, but uh, the R-18 did and was there uh, for quite a few years. And then in, I believe it's 1930, uh, it was mothballed in Philadelphia, and then it was recommissioned when World War II broke out. And again, not with my grandfather, but I found this historical uh, picture of uh, the crew of not the R-18, but the R-19 uh, in Pearl Harbor in 1921. And this uh, poor fellow uh, was soon to lose his life uh, when he was promoted to captain of the a new S-4 submarine, and uh, they had an accident, and all hands were lost uh, when he was captain. So my grandfather got out of the Navy uh, April 14th. He went into the Navy April 9th, so he served two years almost to the date, uh, and he returned home. This is him at the beach. I'm not sure whether this is a Connecticut beach or a Rhode Island beach, but that's my grandmother. And this is in the early 1920s. And they were married and uh, were married for over 50 years. So they were married in 1923 at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Norwich. And in 1924 had my mother. Uh, Elizabeth, their first daughter, and that's a picture of Dick. 
as a businessman in Norwich. And he made a living uh, selling real estate and insurance in Norwich. Um, uh, his wife, Helen, who maybe some of you know or remember, um, before marrying Dick, she was the secretary of the principal of Norwich Free Academy, where my mother and father went to high school. So I told you that I had a third source of pictures, and the third source of pictures that I have is of Ezra Chandler. And I'll just go through these quickly because there's only a few. But here's Ezra at 18 years old, uh, going into the Navy shortly. Here he is on leave in 1918 with his mother, Alice. He was a Mormon from Utah, and his mother lived in Utah. This is a picture of him on leave with his soon-to-be wife, Catherine, who he was married to for over 50 years. And this is, I think, the most interesting part of the story, how this part came together. When you think there are over 10 million people in Los Angeles, over 40 million people in California, uh, the odds of this happening had to be one in a million. But I had always been interested in a postcard that my grandfather had sent to my grandmother that she kept. And I misplaced it, but I'm going to find it uh, when I get more time. But he wrote something like a stupid 18-year-old would write his fiance in pencil on the back of a penny postcard and mailed it from San Pedro. And we were living near San Pedro. I'm working in Long Beach. And I thought, oh my god, I never knew my grandfather was in California. I never knew he... Uh, was in San Pedro, so that kind of started my search uh, of him. So um, I have a good friend, uh, Mark Pollan, who I have been friends with for 35 years. Uh, we've coached together, we've been neighbors, we've been friends, we share Dodger tickets, we're on the aquarium board together, and we're investors together in an aquaculture project in California off the coast of Long Beach where we have a 100 acre plot six miles off of Long Beach and we're growing blue Mediterranean mussels uh, commercially. So after having known Mark for 30 years and this never coming up, We're at the headquarters of Catalina Sea Ranch, which is our mussel uh, farm. And we were able to be housed uh, and have our headquarters on, at the old Pier 1 in San Pedro. And Pier 1 is where the U.S. submarine base was 100 years before. And Mark and I are coming out of a meeting, and I say to Mark, <coughs> Mark, you won't believe this, but a hundred years ago, my grandfather stood where we're standing, you know, on this dock a hundred years ago. He was a, a submariner in World War I. And Mark says to me, you're kidding. My grandfather was a submariner in World War I. And we do a little research and lo and behold, if they're both not on the R-18 at the same time, and they're shipmates uh, on the R-18, and that's only, you know, one of the uh, small world uh, coincidences between them. But, you know, we were so lucky that that came up because... You know, we never would have had that uh, come up, but for my saying that. So that's, we're at the aquarium after a board meeting. Uh, that's Mark on the left and me on the right. 
And this is the picture that I asked you to pay attention to early on when the submarine base opened uh, in San Pedro in 1917 at Pier 1. And this is a picture today of Pier 1. And it's taken um, from our uh, workboat uh, for Catalina's Sea Ranch. And we have some very prestigious neighbors. This is Bob Ballard's uh, Nautilus uh, exploration boat, who was a neighbor of ours. And he's done 200 deep sea dives. And he's found the Titanic. And he's found uh, so many Navy ships and so many treasures. And this is all of his you know, gear and research equipment. And he's, it's quite the uh, vessel. Another neighbor of ours is SpaceX. And I don't know if you've been following the exploits of uh, Elon Musk, but you know, he has developed a technology where they launch missiles, SpaceX missiles, and then they recapture the spent rockets. And it's not like they just go out in the ocean and retrieve them. They actually land them vertically on a barge in the middle of the ocean. And it's just a miracle. I mean, how can you possibly get a spent rocket and land it vertically and have it come down without killing somebody on the barge? And then these arms come out, and it's brought back to this location um, by Tug with a missile erect, and it's processed over a week before it goes from erect to supine and is towed away to be used again. Here's another picture of the rocket, and you can see the arms that come out and hold it on the barge, and uh, it's quite the, quite the neighbor. So. In the small world category of, you know, Dick Moran and Ezra Chandler, a Catholic from Norwich, Connecticut, and a Mormon from Utah, uh, being shipmates on uh, in World War One, Ezra was a blacksmith, uh, but they're both born in the same year. Uh, Neither graduated from high school. Dick made it to the 8th grade. Ezra made it to the 11th grade. Both enlisted in the Navy. Uh, Dick from Norwich on April 9th and Ezra uh, in Los Angeles on May 18th, 1917. Both were submariners. Both served on the USS uh, R-18 uh, in early 1918 and uh, I mean, late 1918 and early 1919 in Panama and in San Pedro together. Ezra had the pleasure of being in the Navy two months longer, so he got to go to Honolulu, which must have been a great adventure. Uh, but my grandfather didn't. Uh, both were married. Uh, Dick married Helen and was married for 55 years. And Ezra married Catherine, and they were married for 53 years. Um, Dick died in Rhode Island in 1978 at age 80. And Ezra died in Redondo Beach, California in 1972 at age 74. So I thought it was uh, such a miracle that we connected uh, the two and that they had so many things in, in common uh, in their life. Or Anne had her hand up first. Did your grandfather talk about his experience? He didn't. You know, and Marlene on the way over said, you know, we're so sorry that we never asked him more questions because now I've got a million questions for him. But he never talked about his uh, World War I but he did have phobia. career. But um, he did suffer phobias. Um, and we were aware of his phobias. Um, I think, you know, in 1918, uh, nobody thought anything bad of bullying or hazing. That was just kind of par for the course. So my father, my grandfather, as a 
you know, rookie on the R18 was put uh, in a torpedo tube and terrorized. And he always was claustrophobic uh, after that. I, he s survived on the R-18 much longer than that, and that certainly was, uh, you know, something. But he was claustrophobic. He was, uh, when you're scared of heights, is it agoraphobic? He didn't like to go over the bridge to New London because it was too high. Um, but I think some of those... I don't know where he got all of the, his phobias, but uh, I just wonder whether at least the claustrophobia, you know, didn't come from that bad episode uh, on the R-18. I, um, I understand, and I don't know from where, in the 70s, that submariners, is that how you say it, are screened temperamentally so that anyone with a tendency for claustrophobia or um, fears like that are screened out and they also have to be very mild-mannered and slow to anger and easygoing because they have to be a, a, away from the sun and underwater for long periods of time. So on the aquarium board with Mark and I is a, is a uh, <coughs> former um, Navy captain who was uh, on a modern day submarine and they would go under the ice and I think they would stay 30 days or 90 days or something, you know, under the ice. Um, but those, if you've been to the Naval Museum and you see how big the Nautilus is, I think these newer ships are even bigger than the Nautilus, so they have a little bit more elbow room but probably bigger crews, but you're still I mean, can you be a, can you imagine being under the ice for 90 days uh, in close quarters, you, I think Lee is right, you better be able to get along with uh, people. <laughs> <laughs> your boss. Your... Yep. Yeah. Yes? I thought it was great that your grandmother, was it, who kept uh, these photographs, yeah. but did he ever write any letters to her or any other text material that uh, she collected? Yes. So we have his writing on the back of photographs, but, um, and I have that postcard that I've seen, but can't put my finger on right now. Um, but other than that, I don't think he was an educated person, and I don't think he was a great writer or a great reader. The other question I had was you answered it about being diesel powered. Yeah. The diesel powered, but was that, maybe this gentleman can yeah. answer that, they bolted together back then? So they, they as I understand that the R18 had two 500 horsepower diesel engines, but it also had two 400 horsepower electric engines that were battery powered that I guess they would use when they would submerge. But I'm not sure how long, you know, World War I submarines could stay under. Uh, uh, right now, I, I, when you said about a pair of things, uh, about a month ago, we had a second diary given to us, which I didn't know at the time until my archivist says, Steve, we already have one. Uh, it's from an L-class submarine, L-7, don't quote me, that uh, they went on patrols out of Bantry Bay. So the United States in World War One sent a bunch of submarines over to Via the Azores. <coughs> First time we went overseas to Bantry Bay and do patrols, and they do eight-day patrols they would go out and uh, submerge during the day and it would be an eight hour run at about 60 feet and then they would come up and they would run uh, one diesel engine to charge the batteries at night for about four hours and then run the other engine to go on the surface and then they redive the boat again for the daytime and run a battery power through the day. So thank you for paying close attention. I appreciate your interest.